Hey team, this is Grant David Collins and welcome to Basement Philanthropy, a place for people who do not want to wait until they're rich or retired to create meaning, impact, and connection with their time, talents, and money, regardless of the amount. On this episode, we're going to be exploring the neuroscience behind altruism, so let's get started. A few months ago, I discovered the book, The Altruistic Brain by Donald Pfaff. Now, Donald is the head of the Laboratory of Neuroscience and Behavior at Rockefeller University in New York City. And what I found fascinating about this book is that it proved a hypothesis correct that Alex Pocock, a previous person who has been on this podcast, put out there. A few episodes ago, he said this. I really believe that all human beings have that kind of hardwired into our our being. Hmm. I, I, I really believe that, actually. Um, I really think that humans are good by nature, and there is this innate drive to help people. Donald expresses this idea in this quote from the book. He says, the human brain is actually programmed to make us care for others. Many of our basic drives, reactions, and skills are more products of nature than of nurture. The innate biology of the human brain compels us to be kind. That is, we are wired for good will. I love the sentiment around that. We are wired as human beings for good will. Now, before we jump straight into the altruistic brain theory, I want to put out something that might be helpful for us as we explore this theory together. Because it is rooted in evolutionary biology, there is this potential conflict that can happen between this belief in a higher power and this belief in evolutionary biology. And first of all, I don't think that that ever needs to be the case, but if for one reason or another you find yourself in the middle of that battle, What I would just invite you to do is place that on a shelf and look at altruism from a diverse perspective because that diversity of thought is really what is going to allow us to become better philanthropists or or better givers. And the mechanisms or the brain mechanics behind our altruism can really impact this type of situation. And so if that ever comes up for you, I just would invite you to just place that on the side while we are working through this. It's going to be there when you get back. The first foundational theory that we need to talk through is called the selfish DNA theory. And this is the evolutionary theory that inherently our DNA or our genes are selfish in the sense that they would like to be passed on from one generation to the other. And so that becomes the prime focus of the organism that has the DNA is to pass this on from one generation to another at all costs, which leads us into the second theory, which is called the kin selection theory, that allows an organism to be able to pass this on at a greater success rate by getting involved with close ties to that DNA. So if I am part of the same family, my DNA shows up in a similar way. And so I'm going to be more predisposed to be involved with helping my brother out because he shares a lot of my DNA. So his success is in some ways my success from an evolutionary perspective. So all these theories come together around the success of the human race, that as our species began to grow and develop, that we were better able to hunt and gather food because of the application of these theories. We were better able to raise our children because of the application of these theories and ultimately the success of humanity came from our predisposition to pass our genes on. And so we're going to do whatever that takes. And working together became one of the mechanisms for us to be able to make sure that that was created. 
Now, as we transition over into the neuroscience of the equation, which is set up by us understanding some of the drivers of this need to be altruistic, we're going to talk about Foff's five-step approach to the neuromechanics that are in our brain working through this process. Now, I'm not actually going to go through the mechanism side or the study side of this theory. You can find all of that in the book if that's something that you would like to do greater research around. I'm just going to talk through the simple step process that will allow you to see what is happening in your brain every time there is an opportunity to give or be involved with helping somebody else. So the first step of this theory is that your central nervous system registers the act that you are about to perform towards another person. So you're walking down the street and you see somebody who needs help carrying a box inside and your brain registers, hey, there is a person out there that is struggling with a box. The second step that then starts to happen is that you picture that person who will be the target of your potential act. So the person that's lifting the box, your brain starts to create an image of them within your neuro processes that do that. The third step is that this image that was created begins to blur with your personal vision or ideals of yourself, meaning that your brain starts to see this individual who is needing help lifting this box as itself. So how would it like you to interact if you were in that same position, that is what starts to occur because looking back at some of those theories that we were talking about, we are wanting to be able to create a world that we survive in. And so it makes sense that our brain would start to mesh those two pictures together to be able to have us act in a way that helps somebody else. So then the fourth step that comes up is that you then experience the feelings which allow you to evaluate the consequences of a potential act. Once the act is represented in your brain and your combined self and other image is in place, neurons in your prefrontal cortex place a positive or a negative value on the act. So as you're evaluating that picture that is being created, you start to determine if what is actually happening is going to create what you would like in the world, which then leads us to the final step, which is the decision point. And you decide in step five whether or not to act. And according to step four, if the consequences of the act are good, you perform it. If it is bad, you don't. And so this really connects back to what we were talking about earlier in the podcast about what Donald expresses that we are wired to do good. So as we're working through this process, we have this predisposition to go and help this person with the box because of the way that this operates. Now, many of you may be thinking, but Grant, what happens in the world where people do things that are bad or when people don't help with the box? Well, Donald also addresses this in the book. He says that in a book about natural predisposition towards altruistic behavior, it would be ludicrous to ignore criminal and other egregious forms of behavior that we all see around us. Rather, humans are equipped to regulate and limit these behaviors, provided that conditions encourage them to do so. So essentially what Donald is saying is that while these mechanisms are in place, there are a ton of other things going on in our daily lives that could push us to one way or another. But if things are neutral or, or natural, we are predisposed to be good in those scenarios. And that's a really cool way to start looking at our life. Like it doesn't just affect ourselves. It affects the way that we look at the people around us. Like how would your life change if you actually believed that everybody had a predisposition to do the right thing? 
there's so much out there in the world that is the opposite, that people are willing to do anything to throw you under the bus or to create an experience where that isn't the case. But this theory suggests that while we do have those tendencies over time, our humanity has come to the point where we are predisposed to goodness, which is just incredible. Like I can imagine a world that we all trust each other and, and, and that would be an amazing place to live in. And that can be created as we go out there and do that inherently. Now, instead of discussing this theory from a high level perspective, meaning let's talk about how to implement different laws or organizations or communities that will allow this altruistic brain to really come out of us. I want to turn it back actually to ourselves because often we are our harshest critics. We are the ones that are saying that we are actually not that way because we know what is going on inside of our brains, our thoughts, our actions, the context of our lives. And I want to ask you the question, how would your life be different if you believed that you had a predisposition to do good? How would that change the way that you looked at yourself? How would that change the way that you interacted with others? How would that change the way that you saw yourself as mattering in a world that needs as much goodness as we can possibly create? Now, those questions might bring up some things for you. And what I would just ask you to do is, is just to not be judgmental around those things. If the answer to the question is, I don't really believe that, Grant. Like there's an opportunity for you to be around it. And there is an entire book that says otherwise that has hundreds of references to scientific backed theories that fall into this path around our predisposition to do good in the world. So if you're having any questions about that at all, I would just invite you to go pick up a copy of The Altruistic Brain and start to think through what life might look like if you did believe that you were good inherently. The beautiful thing about believing that we are good is that it creates an environment where we can learn the skill of philanthropy and giving. Because just like somebody doesn't grow up and all of a sudden know how to play basketball or, or be good at baseball or speaking or math or whatever it is, we have the same thing happening with our giving. And the way that our brains work is that over time, as we continue to be around a concept or, or a subject or an action like a free throw, we can get better and better because those connections are stronger and the reward systems are in place and all those different things that happen from a neurological level comes to fruition. And so that is exactly how our giving can be as we start to get involved with this. And that's why we're so focused on just doing the first thing. That's why this whole podcast is about doing the initial giving so that we can have that experience that helps the next time to be a little bit easier to get involved with. And those neurons start to come together in a way that is beautiful and then creates this desire and space for us to be inherently good. Well, team, that's it for me. Let's go out in the world and create good with this new found theory around neurobiology and our time and our talents and our money together. Talk soon.